So I'm going to go ahead and be blunt with you guys. I've been hesitant about doing the Metal Gear Solid series for quite a while. Uh, over a year. Uh, over two years, really, if you get down to it. And there's some reasons for that. I'll go into that in a minute. But I finally caved in because when I opened the floodgates some time ago with when I finished the Kingdom Hearts series for games you guys wanted me to ruminate on, or books, or movies, or whatever. Um, the most requested feature by one vote was for me to look at the Metal Gear Solid series, and, well, okay. The, the people have spoken, so I suppose I will do this. Now, I've talked on the stream before about why I don't want to ruminate on these games. It really boils down to three things. Number one, I never really enjoyed playing any of these games except for Metal Gear Solid 3, which I did enjoy a fair amount. But the other three <laughs> games on the list, never really got into those, so replaying them, eh. The second thing is... <sighs> There's no getting around this. These games have been deconstructed and ripped apart and analyzed possibly more than any other game series that is out there. I'll be talking about one of the reasons why that is in a bit, but there's no denying that simple fact. And I really am hesitant about walking into such territory that is so well trod upon. Which brings me to my third point. I am concerned about living up to your guys' expectations, to be completely honest. I'm not sure I have anything new to add to this discussion. Now, I do have one thing in my favor, at least for my own personal uh, sanity and self-confidence, I suppose. And that's the fact that I haven't actually read up on any of this stuff. I have not read or watched or heard or whatever any of these analyses and deconstructions of the Metal Gear Solid series, other than a few very basic points. And, of course, my own discussions with my friends, so, which doesn't actually count. So I'm walking into this basically blind. Not, and, I, and then it's comfort to me, because that means that even though I'm probably going to be repeating things other people have said, I'm not doing it on purpose. I am just giving my own thoughts, and if they mimic theirs... Oh well, nothing I can do about that, other than not ruminate on this series. So there you go. Now, let's talk about one, uh, one other thing, really quick, before I get into this. Um, this f series we're going to be looking at will be Metal Gear Solid, Solid 1, Metal Gear Solid 2, Metal Gear Solid 3, Metal Gear Solid 4. Okay? Not the NES games, not the portable games, not the new stuff. This was the request, this 4 franchise. And I know what you're going to say, well I request the others. Please don't. <laughs> Maybe is the best I've got for you for those. Now, I, I have played uh, one of the PSP games, and I'm well aware of the plot of it. And I don't remember if there's been more than one. I know there's been more than one game since then. And, of course, Revengeance, which... <laughs> I'm not sure if that counts. And with five coming out soon... Eh, moving along. You'll notice I specifically mentioned we will not be looking at Metal Gear 1 here. Ideally, that will be looked at in a then and now. Depending on scheduling, the idea is for the then and now of Metal Gear to come out pretty much right around now, either the week previous or the week next. We'll see how that lines up. But regardless, I am hopeful to look at that game in its own right on its own side. But I do want to talk about Metal Gear 1 here, at least for a little bit. And the reason why is Metal Gear... The original. I'm not really going to be talking about Metal Gear 2. That's kind of a crap game. The reason I want to talk about Metal Gear 1, though, is it represented the beginning of an interesting niche market in gamers. Some people, uh, you know, it, it's always weird trying to explain the perspectives of older times to modern, you know, people who didn't live through them, basically. I've had troubles trying to explain to people what it was like, you know, in the Cold War, for example to name one of my more commonly mentioned things. But while the NES era was booming, while the NES was in its golden golden age, there were a lot of games, and a lot of people played them, and they were becoming more and more common in households, right? And that meant, because it was reaching a wider base, that meant within that base, sub-bases could happen, niches could happen, right? Because before... You know, it, it, in the beginnings of the NES era, you, you couldn't really pull that off because just about every game that came out of the NES had to be, uh, had to be a game appealing to gamers as a whole because the market wasn't that large yet. By the time Metal Gear came out, they could actually you know, let's let's try something different. And Metal Gear did try something different. It was a stealth game, kinda. It was still an action game. You could still shoot your way through things, at least for some portions of it. 
It was also ridiculously unforgiving, at least by memory. We'll see how that uh, weighs up later. And it introduced a type of gameplay that hadn't really been focused on, at least in console gaming at that point in time. The idea of trying to be so good that you don't need to kill your way through the enemy base. Most games, players have come up with ways to do that. They're called pacifist runs. Pacifist runs of Contra, pacifist runs of Ninja Gaiden, pacifist runs of Mega Man, etc., right? The idea of being good enough to not have to destroy your enemy. You can just make your way through. Metal Gear specifically was designed to appeal to that type of gameplay. And, and out of Metal Gear came all sorts of you know, other things. You know, the no-kill run, of course, or the pacifist run, whatever you want to call it, has become a staple of the Metal Gear series. But in addition to that, the idea of you know, never, uh, never being detected, for example, never getting your warning among a certain level, all sorts of little challenges came up and cropped up around this game. And it built this whole niche of gaming, of, of this subculture of gaming over there, the people who really liked that type of gameplay. Fast forward a few years... The Nintendo Corporation of Awesome has finally become the Nintendo Corporation of OK. <laughs> the N64 has just come out, and it has a relatively lackluster library that mostly focuses on local multiplayer. And they let slip through their fingers something that eventually would be called the PlayStation. Now, this was an interesting era in gaming. I've talked before about one of the big reasons why Final Fantasy VII was the Final Fantasy to so many people. And it all boils down to just the times and the market. It's actually kind of literally luck. Um, not to say FF7 is a bad game, nor to insult anybody who really likes FF7. Hell, I like FF7. But the point is, at that point in time, time gaming had moved from being a subculture of our, of, you know, our society here to being part of everyday life. People who were not gamers were now playing video games for basically the first time. And this was a whole new era in terms of how gaming worked and how video games were approached. And it allowed for a lot of stretching out and broadening of horizons, broadening of gameplay styles, broadening of storytelling styles. So many things happened in this particular era. And, you know, credit where credit is due, most of this is because of the PlayStation, which was well-received, well-marketed, and bought like crazy. And it was the only time the PlayStation could have done something like that because in the NES and SNES eras, Nintendo had such a dominant hold that the many other consoles that did come out in that era, and I know a lot of people tend to forget about them, but there were like dozens of consoles that came out in those eras that failed or at best had a very small library and then quietly sank into the distance. You know, Anyone remember the Jaguar, just to name one example? But the PlayStation came out when Nintendo's stranglehold had fallen. So the PlayStation had, that, had, had the door open for them, and it was a time when gaming is available freely. And because of that wider market base, they had the ability to focus in on niche gameplay more. And one final thing that really helped this game, two actually things, final things that really helped this game when it came out, was one, this was the era when graphics were still considered a pretty big deal in gaming. I know that sounds weird to say, but believe it or not, there was a point in time when having really nice graphics in a game was a selling point, and people would buy a game because, oh my god, look at those amazing graphics. I know that sounds so weird in the modern era, but yeah, back in the mid to late 90s, it was like, oh my god, and Metal Gear Solid's graphics were amazing for the time. I personally don't think they have aged very well. But it is worth noting that regardless of the graphical quality, there is no denying that a huge amount of effort was put into the graphics, into little details. If I can segue for just a moment to share a story, I remember distinctly, I was working at the time, obviously, uh, pushing myself through college, and I was, uh, I was a video manager at a store called Hastings, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, and I was setting up you know, the PlayStation with Metal Gear Solid is the thing. And I set it in a specific spot. I couldn't tell you where that spot is now, but I can remember it distinctly. It was, it, was, it was outside somewhere in Shadow Moses, and there was a mouse. I can remember this so perfectly. There's a mouse that just walks around and occasionally would go around and hide in a hole and stuff like that. And I left Snake there for people to come by, you know, back when you could actually play games randomly just to try them out in the middle of a video store. I, don't, I haven't seen that happen in a long time. Of course, this was almost two decades. This was two decades ago. Point being, I cannot begin to count how many people came by over the next several days and were just like, 
oh my god, and just marveled at the graphics. And people who, you know, people of all sorts, kids, elderly, in between, men, women, uh, in between, doesn't matter. Everyone came by and were just like, oh my god, look at this. And they'd pick it up and they'd move the camera around, like, look, we can sneak around. And oh my god, look at this. This is so cool. That appeal. Like I said, timing-wise, it was the perfect time for a game with that level of quality to come out in its graphics alone in order to appeal to such a broader audience because they're like, oh my god, this is amazing. And that brings me to my last point, uh, the final point that what they did. The game was... It had options, I think is probably the best way to put this. It was clearly intended to be a stealth game. And Lord knows there's many... Actually, if memory serves, it's actually impossible to do a true no-kill run in the original Metal Gear Solid, but I am almost positive that in the remake, uh, the, the proper remake, I might add, which I got on the GameCube for curious people, um, it is possible to go through and do a no-kill run and, and not kill, you know, do a, do a takedown of the bosses. I could be wrong about that, but the point is... The whole the game was obviously designed to be the same type of stealth gameplay. Don't get caught. Elite. You know, it and that's the other thing that this kind of thing appeals to people. And and I, I'm speaking from personal experience as well here. The idea of being so good, so elite, so much better than all the other mooks and soldiers and whatnot, that you don't have to kill anyone. That you're just that much better. And that's an appealing thought, especially if you can pull it off. Hence the appeal of the pacifist run for so many years. And so it was designed to that gameplay, but it was optional. If you wanted, you could go through and kill everybody. You could empty the base if you really wanted. And that still worked. So it had the niche appeal, but if you didn't weren't a part of that niche, you could still play the game and enjoy it. All of this culminated to receive a game that came out and was and exploded in popularity. Metal Gear Solid took the United States by storm. I don't actually know personally how well it was received anywhere else. I don't. Feel free to let, fill me in. I am genuinely curious. But I don't know how it went in Europe or in Asia or Australia or anywhere else. I just know that here it exploded in popularity. Couldn't get away from it. <laughs> it was actually kind of irritating for a little bit there. It was, it was talked about all over the place, even at college, for God's sakes. You know, I had one of my professors talk about uh, it with regards to nuclear theory and, and, and the idea of mutually assured destruction. We'll be talking about that when we actually get to Metal Gear Solid 1. But the whole thing gave a launching point. Now we're going to talk about something else. And we're going to talk about it here because it, res it, 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 impl it applies to the entire series as a whole, even to the games I'm not talking about, the, the Portables, Revengeance, and of course, most importantly, I think, 5, the one that's coming out soon. I feel bad for Hideo Kojima. Hideo Kojima is someone who got really good at doing his particular brand of, of production, I guess is the way to put that. And as a result, became, people became fans of that. Now the man has tried to branch out several times to do different things. In the series itself as well, but mostly outside, trying to do something other than Metal Gear. Whether he has failed or succeeded is dependent on individual perspective, but there's no denying that he keeps getting roped back into Metal Gear. He is chained to it now. And I, I sympathize with the man for that. It is also worth noting that I've genuinely sympathized for him because he has the same problem I mentioned earlier. It's just a billion times worse. People expect good things from him. At this point in time, if he puts out a game that is okay... People tend to be like, ah, and will be more negatively impacted by it than they otherwise would. I, I speak generally, of course, not specifically. But in general, people tend to be more... And this happened with Metal Gear Solid 4. This happened with several of the, play, uh, the portable games. They looked at it and said, well, this is an okay game, which, you know, under normal circumstances would have been rated, you know, I don't know, a 5 or a 6 out of 10, from 0 to 10. But because it was a Hideo Kojima game, because it was a Metal Gear game, it should have been better. So they rated it lower, so their opinion was lower. It is also worth noting, Hideo Kojima... I don't want to talk too much about this, because to this day, I do not know the exact facts. But from what I do know, and from what I have seen and analyzed, the pieces do line up pretty well. Hideo Kojima had some issues during the production of Metal Gear Solid 2. 
we again i don't know exactly and with 100 percent certainty what those issues were but everything i've heard has said that he was having mental instability issues that he actually had a bit of a psychotic breakdown not actually like he was he was mentally disabled let's make this clear for those of you who do not know the distinction someone who is mentally disabled or someone who has a mental instability or a mental illness is someone who has that and probably will have that for the rest of their lives and probably needs medication to stay functional. I'm not going to talk about that in depth right now because that's not really the point. Someone who has a psychotic breakdown is someone who the stress, emotional, mental, sometimes physical, gets to them to the point where they just cannot function normally. It is a temporary thing. It's like someone who has a severe wound as opposed to someone whose muscle tissue is, is not rebuilding itself properly. It's not systemic, in other words. But from whatever I've heard, he had a genuine breakdown, and it shows. It really shows in Metal Gear Solid 2. I'm not even talking about the, 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 the things you're probably thinking. Really listen to what the words are. Really pay attention to how the scenes are being presented. And what you see is someone who is basically ranting and raging at the player and doing so in a way that very much invokes the idea that Hideo at the time was very resentful of his player base, probably for that same reason I mentioned before, the idea of the expectation, the stress. I mean, there's a reason so many entertainers across, across the last century or two have turned to horrible things in order to try and assuage themselves of their stress because it is very stressful having that constant expectation upon yourself. Again, this is all me not speaking ill of the man. Quite the contrary. Like I said, I have a tremendous amount of sympathy for him. It is also worth noting that the game that I enjoy most is the one that leaned the furthest away from the formula and also had the least direct input from Kojima itself. That would be Metal Gear Solid 3. He did have input in this game. Let's, let's make this absolutely clear. But it was much more of a collaborative effort than the other three that I'm going to be talking about have been. And he deliberately... Try, they, I should say, deliberately tried to do something a little bit different than the norm. And I, again, this is all speculation, except for the initial part. Uh, you know, the, the, he had an issue. That's the only part that's fact. All of this is speculation. That just happens to fit the facts. <sighs> Forgive me for the Spock quote. But I feel like he, they, I'm going to just say he, because really that is the part about it. He tried something different specifically to try and branch out, specifically to try and de-stress a bit and try to, okay, you know, I'm going to do my own thing that I creatively want to do. We'll see how it works. And it did work. So, you know, props. Take that with a grain of salt, as ever I try to be honest with my viewers, but I am pretty convinced of that whole situation. But that now, now that I've said that, I want to say something else about Hideo Kojima, and this is directly related to the previous point, because, as I mentioned, there's only a couple facts in that point. You know, he had the mental issue, whatever. Oh, he had the issue, excuse me. It's not even mental. He had issues, whatever it was. Lots of expectation, lots of stress, right? I feel like people too put too much of the credit on Kojima's shoulders. Now, we as human beings do this in general. We do this in everything. How many people point to the President of the United States as the guy who is the face for America? And this is true in other countries, too, by the way. I know several British people who point to the Prime Minister as the British face, even though the Prime Minister isn't really responsible for most of the things they're actually upset about. Um, how many people point to uh, uh, Miyamoto? as the guy who invented, you know, this thing or that thing at Nintendo. How many people point to Itoi as the guy who invented Earthbound? Now, in all of these cases, you're probably noticing a trend. It's twofold. twofold. Number one, in all of these cases, whoever was involved was someone who was very well involved, someone who really was fully invested in the project, basically working on it full-time, and I, I can almost guarantee you, over full-time, trying to, to put their all into this, right? It was more than their full-time job, right? The second point is all of these people were people who are more publicly viewable than others who are also involved in whatever it is, in the running of a country, in, in the production of a movie. This is true in movies, too. Who do we give credit for most movies? Directors and actors. Do you know how many people go into making a movie? And yet the people who get the most credit publicly, normally, generalized, is the directors and the actors, because they put a lot of themselves into it, 
and because they're more publicly available. And we as humans like having a label or an individual, a point, one person to point to and say, you did this. This is just human nature. This is actually kind of the inverse of the Morden speech from Mass Effect 2. It's hard to conceptualize saving the galaxy. So instead you think about your nephew, right? Similarly, it's hard to con conceptualize the hundred or thousand people who put together this game, movie, book, who run this country. Instead we say that person did. Because you can understand a person. You can conceptualize a person. You follow? That being said, there is no denying that Hideo Kojima is very well invested and is definitely a huge driving force behind the Metal Gear Solid series. But I genuinely feel he gets too much credit for it. Too many times, it actually irritated me once upon a time. I'm kind of over that now. But the last time I was thinking about, I was seriously thinking about doing this series, I had a whole speech prepared about how I got sick of how everyone talks about how Kojima is the greatest game producer ever and how he, anything that he makes is going to be perfect. This might be leaning a little bit too much into fanboyism. But the point being, I heard that constantly and how this Kojima thing and this Kojima thing and Kojima was making this game and Kojima was doing this thing and I heard that constantly. Again, the man gets lots of credit, but I, I, I feel like he gets a little bit too much credit. One final thing to talk about, and then I'll cut this off, I swear. I feel like Kojima, especially in the more recent games, and especially, especially in 5, has been trying too hard to push the envelope. Whether he's been doing it for the sake of pushing the envelope, in other words, because Metal Gear Solid has always been a series that pushes the envelope as far as what is acceptable and what is socially normal, that now he feels he has to keep pushing it, uh, sometimes referred to as the South Park effect, or because he genuinely believes these things need to be discussed openly and societally and, and become acceptable within culture so that they can be analyzed properly without taboo being attached to them. Whichever is true, I have no idea. If you ask me honestly, I would say it's probably a mixture of both. But there is no denying that Kojima has always pushed Squick into his games. Now, of all the games, so far only two, four, and five have really did, had something that just made me go, Ugh, and genuinely lowered my, my enjoyment of a game. Three kind of did. We'll talk about that when we get there. But in the, I, I've always felt like these things, it, the games would be better served with them absent. That is just my opinion. It is not my judgment. Because I'm not sure if they would be better without it. What would the games be like with these elements completely removed from them? It is also worth noting that what is Squick is, by definition, dependent on the individual. So I am talking about my personal definition. I'm sure there's some people who think there's more, because of, in, by the definition there is. And I'm sure there's by some people who think, they think there's less, or indeed, none. I only mention this because it's kind of become one of the things that is a staple of the Metal Gear Solid series. And it's one of the reasons I'm not actually that enthused about 5 any more than I normally would be. Because, ugh, you know? But all that aside, let's go ahead and stop here. Because soon we're going to have to go through Metal Gear Solid 1. Uh, we'll be playing the remake for anybody curious. And uh, hopefully we will have something worth talking about. See you then.